Um, I'd like everybody to have something to write on, write with, and I have something for you to write on. That I'm going to pass out. Pencils over there. And and preferably a Bible if there's an extra one or two, or a smartphone where you can look at look yep. up. Bible Bible's in the other room. Who needs, who needs an extra Bible or? Um, I got you. I got my Bible on here. Yeah. Anyone else need a pen or pencil? Um, the just by way of review, when Jeremy and Steve first asked me to come, the subject was something like, uh, as young as young men, how can we know the priorities of life, or how can we? Uh, uh, let's see, how was it that you phrased that, Steve? Oh, uh, competing priorities. How do you balance competing priorities? Was was the question, and then. So I came and just shared, well, you need to know, well, what are, what should our priorities be biblically as believers? What should our priorities be? So we, we engaged in an exercise where we, where we prioritized things and everybody had some great ideas. And, uh, but the, I think we all agreed that the number one priority was God, pursuing God. And then I made the offhand statement, what does that look like? That's, that's a whole nother subject in, if you, want to invite me back, we can talk about that sometime. So uh, that's what we want to talk about today is what does it mean to make God first, um, make God priority in our lives? What what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, And so with that bit of background, let's look at Roman number one on your your handout. And and I've got this so that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you all to take notes that you can take home with you, uh, there will be no test, but if something strikes you that's said that you want to meditate on, pursue further, uh, I'm a big believer in writing things down and not depending upon our memory to um, help us sort out something that maybe the Lord is trying to speak to us. Okay, so the first commandment um, uh, is found in Matthew 22, so let's let's look that up. Uh, let's look up Matthew 22, and I want to talk about that. I just really want to look, I, I list four scriptures there because this same concept is, is, is in at least those four places. Matthew 22, verses 36 uh, through 40. Uh, okay, teacher. Uh, which is the great commandment in the law? And he and Jesus said to him, quote, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. I like that. It's the great commandment and it's the first commandment. And a second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So these two commandments unify the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so if Jesus says that the great command, so write, <clears throat> if you would, write, write out. My question is, what is the first commandment? I'd just like you to write out, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now we'll, we'll talk about the second commandment toward the end if we have time. But the, 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 sec, the second scripture there, Deuteronomy 6, 5, that, that is the actual scripture that Jesus is quoting. You'll notice in your Bibles, verse 37, it's in quotes. So he's quoting Deuteronomy 6 5. Mark 12 30 says essentially the same thing and adds one more interesting word. It adds the word strength. So so Mark says, love the Lord with all your with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Deuteronomy does too. 
Does it? Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank you, Scott. And then Luke 10, 27 says <clears throat> similar. So, you know, so here's, I mean, this is called the first commandment. And it's called the great commandment. Loving God. So I just wanted to kick it around tonight. What do we think that means? And how do we do that? And why is that important? And what happens when we are able to successfully do that? And what happens if we don't? Um, and before I share some of my ideas, I'd love to hear some of yours. Any any thoughts on, on this, the, the great commandment? And I'm going to move this board around. I may, may make some notes as we go. What are y'all's thoughts about that? Response to that? What's been said so far? It, it, it sounds nice, Biff. There's just one problem with it, the word all. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All is the problem. Uh, all, all is a pretty inclusive word. It's a pretty broad <laughs> word, isn't it? All. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What does that mean? That gets priority over anything else if you <clears throat> the literal word. I mean Yeah. Yeah. And and whenever I hear the word all, <clears throat> I think of this word, which I love in a and then challenged by wholeheartedness. Would that be a similar way to talk about the way we approach God by giving Him all of our heart? It's a wholeheartedness um, approach to our relationship with God. That's all. That's it. That's And... I would say that <clears throat> to the extent that we can give him our all, walk in wholeheartedness, then I would th I think that uh, our hearts <clears throat> our hearts are full if we're able to do this versus dull. You ever had a dull heart? I have. <laughs> I've walked with the Lord 40 years this summer, this past summer, 40 years. And I've gone through seasons where I felt like my heart was full and tender and responsive and eager and hungry. And I've gone through periods where my heart was dull. The Lord seemed far away. Uh, it was easy to compromise and get into sin, you know. And uh, And what I found was that if I do this part, give him my all, engage in wholehearted seeking, then, then uh, my heart becomes full, tender. Uh, I'm, you're able to do the second commandment, loving others, a whole lot better. Versus my heart becoming dull and areas of compromise seeping in slowly but surely. It's like the tide, you know. You, it comes and you don't know it's coming and then you look down and it's up to your knees. and But you can't see it rising, but you look at it 15 minutes later and the level's changed. Mm -hmm. That's the way sin and compromise, that's the way compromise works, which invites sin. But what else? Okay, this is great. What else about... About the about the first commandment. <clears throat> well, that word called love that says love. Hmm. Yeah. What, what about that? that? Well, what all does that mean? Yeah. Anybody got a um, response to Steve's question? It's a good question. Well, I'll 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 tell you I'll answer that one. A through F will be an answer to that when we get there. But before we do, anybody else got sort of a general? I I think yeah. just to kind of go back to 
what you were saying about the heart full versus the heart dull. Yeah. And then to tie it in with what he just asked the question about what does it mean to love, the, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that it's ironic that throughout the tide rising, no matter whether you're dull or you're full, he loves you regardless. Absolutely. Which is the irony of it all. Absolutely. It's like how you, you know, we're all striving to love the Lord when he, he already loves us. All we have to do is embrace him and, and accept right. that his love is there and reciprocate. Now, again, I don't know the right. answer to that's That's really good, Scott. It, and here's the way I look at that. Uh, God's love is that way, which is amazing. <laughs> Just how can you how can you how can you comprehend that? That is so great about about him. But here's where the rubber meets the road. <clears throat> My ability to to touch God is it, it, it's up to me. I believe He is there. He is willing. His heart is full toward me, even if I'm in sin. His heart is full toward me. My ability to experience that it goes out the window once I once I know once I'm no longer seeking Him with my whole heart. My ability to experience the love of God and on on a, on, a, on a deep level, which includes my emotions, my ability to experience Him goes out the window when my heart becomes dull. Jeremy. One thing I, I know in, in my own self in, in that regard is I spent a lot of my life struggling with a lot of self-loathing and things like that. And when I'm not feeling, especially I've noticed if I'm not in the Word at least a little bit every day, that I, I do, I start to feel that distance. I get much more depressed yeah. as that, and the self-loathing builds up so that even though Christ is there going, you know, hey, I'm ready to embrace you. It's like you're right. the kid who's like, you've done one wrong thing and you're certain that you're going to be executed. Right. Rather than, it's almost like you don't have the courage to step into it, even though he's right there right. going, and, you know, just doing that kind of pushes back that shame and reminds you, you know what, he knew all of yeah. these things. And it allows you to have that confidence, or it does me anyway, right. to just kind of step into that. And, I mean, I'll notice, just like if I've forgotten during the day, and I'll go through and go, wait, I haven't, I haven't read my Bible. Yeah. And I'll get into that and spend some time with him. It's like my, my attitude shifts. Even my ability to problem solve gets yeah. substantially better. I, I th to say what you're saying... Another way, it's like this. If this is our goal, and we are, and the way to, get, and we're here, and keeping our, and this is Jesus, and keeping our eyes on Jesus involves involves keeping our eyes on Jesus. I mean, going this way. Here's what happens: we we get off track, and we we start going down a little bit, down just a little bit. But it doesn't take long when you're down here. And then, okay, we make a course correction. I don't know whether this looks right or not. My intent is for that to go straight. <laughs> but when we fix our eyes on Jesus, making Him the priority, wholeheartedness, being all in, we get this course correction right here. When we turn our hearts to Him, we get this course correction. And then sometimes, you know, we get, well, not sometimes, we get off course. Now, this can happen within a five-minute period or a five-day period or a five-month period, and then pretty soon we're going up here, all right? So we've got to make a course correction, and we start, we fix our eyes on Him. So, you know, this is my history right here, you know, and that's, of course, way on out there, but uh, the beauty of it is, uh, if I do my part, which are which is mid course corrections, which again can happen several times a day, yeah. or it can happen once a month if I'm having a really good month, you know, more likely it's once every two or three days. I have to remind myself, Biff, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price, and the, the Genesis one God that created the universe loves you. And wants a relationship with you, and you need to respond and give him your all. And uh, 
you know, when I, so that's, that for me is what a mid-course correction looks like. I have a little self-talk, and I make my correction, and I repent of any sin, and it's like I'm back with the Lord. There's this, so, um, so anyway, I appreciate that. One thing that I was thinking of as you were speaking right there in the heart full and dull concept, um, one thing that my extremely nerdy wife, who's fascinated by physics, uh, had told me about, she'd done some research and found out about sponges. And they had discovered that um, you'd think like a dry sponge would absorb more things than like a damp sponge. And that's actually not true. The hard sponge or the dry sponge, it takes it a while to get into an absorbent place. So it, if it's whereas a sponge that's already damp, will absorb more than something that's dry. So as we're yeah. staying in relationship with him, it may not always be this overflowing place, but if we don't just go, oh, well, I'll just do my own thing, and God will give me stuff when he wants to, but we stay in kind of that damp mm -hmm. place, yeah. then we're able to really, when he pours it on, we're actually able to absorb it. You know? That speaks of our capacity, our capacity to... Experience God. Now, I believe that when you're born again, my capacity to ex to to experience God is about like that. That it's a small container. It's a thimble. That represents my capacity. And then over over time, as we give ourselves in wholehearted love to him what he does and this is so beautiful our capacity expands and our ability to love God to know God to know how he thinks to know how he feels to know his heart that expands our capacity to receive from God expands and that's the beauty of walking with him and so capacity is not a static you know, it's it's not it's not. This is what I'm born with in terms of my capacity re to receive from God. And 40 years later, uh, this is the most I can hold. I can hold a whole lot more if I do my part, which is the wholeheartedness, which is loving the Lord, uh, my God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we'll talk about how in a minute. That's if you if you strayed from if you strayed from the Lord and and you're in one of those dull places, mm -hmm. um, can your capacity shrink? I think so, but I think it can quickly be stretched back, right. real quickly. So it's kind of like real quickly. quickly. Yeah, in some ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I do. So what, I do. what do you think? <laughs> Because I, you know, if you look at um, this, is bad to compare. <clears throat> I should not, but I. But you're going to anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you preface it with that comment, <laughs> I, I think we said perfect people need not attend. That's yeah. right, exactly. So, you know what? I, I don't see, and I, I probably included in this as well. In dull times, not people not doing this, and you see it in the church. Oh, yeah. And I think I probably know less people that do this, and more people that are are. I don't know if they're if fearful of what that actually means, or but the, why do you think people don't focus shrink on this? Back. They shrink back. Is why do you think we have a zigzag line instead of a straight arrow? Is that it's what we're not perfect, but. Um, I look to some of the folks in church, and I know that this is what they're doing. Right. But I don't. Now, when you say what they're this, you know this is what 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 that they're doing. Shrinking, the shrinking, shrinking back, back from the wholehearted, oh, the wholehearted, right. the wholehearted. They're they're you you doing? They, the they seem to me that they seem to me from, from outward appearances, which is not a good judgment as well. Mm -hmm. And maybe it should just be between me and God, nobody else. But. I see people that are this way. And I, I know that for my life, I've been more dull than I have than I have been um, all or full. So, you know, I, I, I ask myself, what keeps people from having that 
internal drive and, mm-hmm. and wanting to do the all in. Right. I don't Instead even think they, I don't half think it's in that they, or a quarter in. I don't think that's the, that they don't want to. I think this thing is dumb. They don't. I mean, I think you can have the best intentions in the world. And, and like you said, it's all about the decisions you make. And every, you know, couple of days, mm-hmm. you have a choice of whether or not to give in to temptation, whatever it is. And, you know, I think you'd be surprised that most people aren't always on that wholehearted path. I think we all are doing this. Yeah, but I think there's something Tim mentioned. He he kind of glossed over it, and I think he's dead <laughs> on. He brought up fear. He said it's almost like they're afraid of it. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I think that word "all" is terrifying because "all" means well, no, I, I want I, I want to I want to control how much I am at risk. All all has no control as a guy for me anyway. That's horrifying. It's like all, I mean, I could give all, we've all had the notion of I could give all my heart to a woman and she could stomp on it. I could lose everything. Right. And that notion, I mean, I spent a lot of my life not really trusting God. And so I had a, you know, three quarters of my 50, you know, I'll, I'll give him 50. He said 50. I'm, you 50, three quarters 50, of the Three quarters and then 50. <laughs> you know, I started and I, I, I know for me, when you get to that term, even now, even though I, you know, I've worked out a lot of our issues, that all is still kind of horrifying. I see that and I go, can I do that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I think I get into trouble where I try, I focus on that word rather than just trying to give myself to God and let him determine the percentages that I'm shooting for him, I'm aiming at him, and that he'll get me up to all. I don't need to figure out a way to get to Yeah, all is, all is a scary. All right, let me show you what, what I think we're saying here. So the question is, why do people shrink back? I'm, now, this is just a short list that I just came up with based on our conversation. I think, number one, I think people tend to be, I tend to be comfortable in my complacency. I tend to get in a rut, and I don't really want to be disturbed. Uh, so I think being comfortable in my complacency is one reason. Number two, fear. That was mentioned. And to me, the fear is related to can he, capital H, can God be trusted? Mm-hmm. If I'm fearful of what might happen if I give him my all, I'm basically saying, I don't trust you, God. You're not really good. You might do something. You might make me do something crazy. <laughs> and, it's a, and, and so that is fundamentally a lack of understanding of who he is. Because if we really know him, we will not be fearful uh, uh, because perfect love casts out that fear and God is God is perfect love and he can be trusted. Uh, shame was mentioned. That, that can keep us, keep us from giving our all. We don't feel like we deserve it. We don't feel like we're qualified. And of course we're not. Jesus makes us qualified. None of us are qualified. None of us are good enough. Uh, that's why Jesus came. Uh, and then I think a lack of being challenged or taught. I think, I think people do need to be challenged. That's why I'm here. And and I'm sure you could add more reasons to the question: Why do people shrink back? But that's a great question. Maybe and, and another thing, just maybe lack of knowledge of God. Ignorance. They don't yeah. know. I mean, yeah. how, do you, how do you head towards Jesus when you don't know Jesus? Exactly. Or how, you know, the, the spiritual poverty, you know, um, not just among us, but in America, is it's really just shocking. I mean, yeah. our, our problem isn't economic poverty, it's spiritual poverty. People are just so ignorant. And that's where we come in with sharing the good news and discipling people. You know, that ignorance is there. A lot of those people are ignorant, but they want to know the truth, or they sure. would respond to the truth if somebody presented it to them. Some yeah. will, some will not. Um, it, just as a DJ, um, you know, lyrics, I hear lyrics all the time, and one of the most popular lyrics of one of the songs right now, and I'm not picking on rap music because there's plenty of rock music and everything else that's out there, but the lyric is, all I care about is money in the city that I'm from. 
Mm-hmm. You only live once. That's the anthem of the motto. Right. And that's the hook. And it's like number one. And it's this huge hit. And all I care about is money in the city that I'm from. Yeah. I was like, wow. The two most right. physical things people right. can understand. And it's the opposite, really, of what God is because you can't see him. Usually what people tend to kind of do in the middle is they'll look at what they learn from their own parents. And I mean, that great quote from Fight Club, if our fathers are our role models for God and our fathers abandon us, what does that say about God? And so at least I know a lot of people I've seen and and stuff that I've seen in my own life where we've seen those physical people who've let us down and then we've made assumptions about God. Right. Let me throw something else on your mix if you've got... A good time. Yeah. Um, just speaking for myself, years ago there was a book that was written that was pretty average to less than average book, but it sold a lot. It was called The Prayer of Jabez. Mm-hmm. Bruce Wilkinson wrote it. After that book, he wrote another book called The Three Chairs. Three Chairs is a pretty good book. Uh, yeah, he had a whole lot more to teach. <coughs> and what I got out of that book... Um, was was that his? He had one chapter on what leads us into temptation, what leads us into sin, and and boy, he hit me on the head, um, and it opened up my eyes to to a lot. And what what he said is that we're more likely to walk away from God when the world's kind of rough with us, when when we've had a failure, when uh, somebody accuses us, or is not nice to us, uh, just when we're emotionally just kind of depleted and beat up. And and I was looking back on myself and, and, you know, how many times that I had said in my life, I'll never do that again, and then I do it again. And, and my self-analysis was that it was at times when I thought that I should have been stronger than what I was, but just everyday life just happened to me. And in my ignorance, I thought, thought that I didn't deserve that. And it's and it's kind of tied into ignorance. I think I think most of us think that life is just supposed to be beautiful and wonderful all the time. And and God does allow suffering in our life. And we usually try to stop it for ourselves and for other people. We, 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 when somebody's having a hard time, we want to do what we can to say what we can to stop them from doing that. And yet, Scripture tells us over and over that it's in the suffering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that our maturity comes and our discipline, the maturity comes. And I'm always trying to stop myself and kind of, you know, drug myself when I get to feeling bad. I, I want to feel better. And it leads me the other way from God. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying to do it myself instead of. So what's the solution? Just roll some, of us, some of it's ignorance. And, and, and really just, I mean, realizing this, this tendency in us to begin with, and, and secondly, let it drive you to your knees. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just you just got to get by yourself, where it's just you and the Lord, and and just let Him have it. Yeah. You know, just 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 tell Him what's going on, and and if He's screwing your life up, you got to tell Him He's screwing. I'm sorry, but that's what you. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the movie Apostle? Yes. Mm-hmm. Long time ago. Where he's up in the and and uh, he's giving it to God because Robert, Robert, who was the guy yeah. Robert Duvall Robert Duvall yeah yeah he directed and produced that movie yeah. and there was that one scene where he's upstairs and this is sunny and you know me and I know you and this is what you're doing wrong he was kind of like yeah. Moses you know and I I don't get that bold but there there are times when you know it's it's not that I need to go do something I just need. To get with God, and Lord, Lord takes care of it. He He and fills your heart back up again. Yeah, right. and He's not threatened by your no. being honest with Him. No, on the contrary, no. He God, loves, God, I'd much rather have you duke it out than run away. The, God, there's a phrase: God only gives grace for reality. When we're in reality, <laughs> then we can re, be a receptor of His grace and He can yeah. change things. But when we're in unreality in our we're own deluded. fantasy land about things, and, and particularly about in the, the misinterpretation of life events, mm-hmm. which is what yeah, I'm that's saying, exactly what we're talking. It's about. a misinterpretation. Uh, and what happens is we misinterpret life events as, and Satan takes that and goes right back here and says, "Can he be trusted?" 
Can God really be trusted? And that's a critical juncture. And it's okay to wrestle with God at that point. Mm-hmm. But when you come out, you've got to you've got to be able to say yes. He can be trusted. Because if you buy in to the lie that he can't be trusted, then you shrink back. Mm-hmm. You can't help oh, but shrink it's over. back. Yeah. It's yeah. over. Yeah. It is. I mean, yeah. you're you're con- and I'm not saying you're not saved. You, you, that you're not going to heaven. No. I'm, I'm just saying you will miss out on the fullness of what God has for you because let's say this is your vessel at that point. This is your this is your capacity to experience God. And when you start shrinking back, you've got all this unused capacity and that's how much you know of Him. Now that's enough to get you to heaven, but look what you've missed out on. He, he, he wants you to be here and you're here. It's, the biblical story is, you know, another lap around the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, you just you're just exactly. not going to receive. You know, it's it's not the way that you do it. But God God's way really is better. And when you won't receive it, you just got to stay out there and wander yeah. in the wilderness for a while longer until you which, finally wake up. Which is the another way of saying that that I under, that I can relate to is God. Uh, we don't get God. It's a pass fail with God, and when we and I don't mean heaven hell when I'm saying that. What I mean is when we do not pass the test, we do not fail. He gives it to us again. Yeah, he yeah. gives us yeah, the take test it over. as Go many on, times stays, another <laughs> another round in the wilderness. Yeah, and so and and that's his graciousness there. You know, he, he he just allows us to take the test again and take the test again. Now we don't we're not growing and we're 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 living with that amount of the of, of, of the knowledge of God and the experience of God when we were meant to be completely full, but that's our choice because we're not willing to give it up. Uh another thing that you were saying, Don, reminds me that in my life I have grown far more from my difficulties than I have from my successes. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Yeah, we all. You know, and so we need to embrace our difficulties as friends. Uh, I think that's somewhere in Hebrews. We need to, inv- no, not Hebrews, where is it? Uh, Count it all joy, my brother. We when encounter various, various trials. When various trials... It's in Corinthians. God has not tempted you yet to the point of shedding blood. Yeah. So, uh, welcome, welcome your trials. Now, that's not easy because yeah. when they come, I promise you, you're in a state of confusion yeah. at that moment. And really, you know, really, bit. I think a lot of times we kind of look at that as being, well, we're just putting a good Christian spin on when life gets really crappy. Right. Right. I mean, I mean really, it sounds like we're just spinning it good. Yeah. But, but, it's, but it's true. I mean, it, it really is how we handle. That's why I just like to watch in our, in our church and the people that are in our flock is to how they handle trials. And I'm so proud of Tim because Tim went through a loss of a job, got fired. And I know that every moment wasn't great for Tim, but he kept his faith. Yeah, you did. You kept your faith. I mean, it was a well. It, I kept my faith, and it was. I just had this. I can just say the Holy Spirit was saying, "Yep, don't worry about this. Yeah, right. don't right. worry. Yeah, right. why, why, why worry about Tim, this? Two, two, two years ago, you That's would have right. jumped off the top of the building. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably about right. You're probably right. And you know, just you know, to cut through the cheese here. A lot of it has to do with what you've endured the last year or so. God's toughened you up. <laughs> now, I think, and just like to get on the subject of... Of Tim. As much as possible. I'm happy to be the subject. No, no, but just it's funny you said that, but just looking back on since I've known you, you know, you were, you were traveling overseas. A lot, which I know you didn't necessarily enjoy. And now, look where you're at. You're here. Good. I mean, that's simple, but it to me it seems pretty clear that that happened for a reason. Now you're you're not having to do all that, and you're, you know. 
And Absolutely. And even things that may make you feel ashamed, like just this thing that cracks me up with God's sense of humor, but the whole thing with the portrait thing. Last year, as a guy, I was very ashamed. I mean, we had no money to the point that my wife finds out they're doing free, you know, pictures of your kids, and you can send it to your mother, like we send them to my mom. And she's like, yeah, I found this. We'll go, we'll go check it out. I'm like, okay. And, but because she was able to go and see that and see yeah. how much that helped our family and all these other people, then she was able to so put it here. here. And now this year, we're doing it in two places, here and the other place. So it's those elements of God loves to take those things that we feel ashamed of and find those ways that it makes us attentive to things we wouldn't have noticed otherwise. Because it's so easy to not look at things when you're just, you're fine, we're good, it's all good. But it's much easier, <laughs> it's much harder to be that way when you're like, no, it's, it's not fine. It kind of sucks. Biff, I'd like to add two things. We don't have to discuss them, just to add. One of them is pride from the standpoint mm-hmm. of what others would think of us. Right. Um, and another one, oh, no, I lost it. Um, getting old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there is a um, oh losing, not wanting to give up control uh, that's the other one I think those are really two that are really characteristic of American culture yeah um, so that's I good those are good those, those are good that's why I well, going back to it, when you were you were talking about um Somebody, somebody said something about this, but um, I was talking to somebody who is, um, um, she's from Puerto Rico, and, and we were talking about how families are. Like, we, we are, your family is amazing because you guys are so close and still stay in touch, but so many families are spread across the country, and there's not that close sense of family, but if you look at God the Father, that is a family, and he, no matter how small or large your family is, I think it, it's important that the God is the glue that holds the family together because God is a father. And if you don't have a close relationship with your father, you don't have that sense of family, and you're not going to have the, the same life that you would if, if, you know, I don't know, it just kind of popped in my head. But. So almost that we're, we're aiming with him, we're going towards him and all his other family members that are like, we're all pulling together because we're getting there. Right, right. Because you guys are my family now too, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, let's move to Roman numeral two. Um, how do we respond to the great and first commandment? Now the first thing I would like to suggest and have you write in is the word obedience. Obedience. Um, and then you can elaborate if you want to on your paper. If not, you can just leave it at that. But uh, Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you shall keep my commandments. That's what he said to his disciples. And we're his disciples. If you love me, you shall keep my commandments. So there is, Jesus correlates love, love of him with obedience. And so... Um, Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is an, is an issue of obedience. Now we, you know, we're going to talk about well, how do we do it? But I just want to establish that fact that it that it that that that, that, that it is an issue of obedience. Now, what um, I got one more thing to say about obedience, but before I do, what else you all want to comment on that? Bring anything else into the obedience part? I was just thinking earlier when Steve was mentioning pride. Uh, I think the flip side or the danger can be um, in an attempt to help people or even help ourselves. You know, what does it look like to love God? We yeah. we kind of fixate on external measurements. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, do this for this amount of time. This, you know, whatever it is. Um, right. And so, even though the intention of the external behavior um, is good, it can never, like, external 
disciplines can never change a person's heart. Correct. Uh, and so, uh, so both ways that there could be a sense of I tried that system, and I felt worse. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt worse about myself when I, you know, didn't read the Bible for a week, and, and you know whatever it is. So we get mm-hmm. caught up maybe in this this new system, or mm-hmm. maybe even more deadly is when we're really good at the system. You know, we can yeah. check all the boxes real efficiently, and then. <clears throat> Then we yeah. we feel very secure and very content right. with where we are. So and, and actually, full of, and, we, and full of pride mm-hmm. that we were able to successfully accomplish this. And so then we walk around and put it on everybody's shoulder that we right. see. Right. We're right. an evangelist it's, for it's our more, system. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I think write a book. Just going yeah. on with with yeah. obedience. Just that. Um, yeah, like some are saying, it's hard not to compare. You know, against other people. Um, so, or even against what we what we suppose the standard to be for ourselves. So, mm-hmm. um, so I don't know how you do guilt free obedience. I don't know if that makes mm-hmm. sense or not. But yeah. Um, well, and when I say obedience, I, here's what I mean. I mean, uh, I mean. Let's see. I'm going to say a setting of our heart, which has which has aspects of determination uh, and 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 um, self-control or not self-control I want to say denying self self-control yeah denying self self-control determination it's a setting of the heart and it's and here's the thing it, this is a good thing we we're so against any sort of rules and regulations, many of us Protestants. We're so against that in our sort of in our nature that we think anytime somebody starts talking about in these terms, obedience, being determined, a setting of your heart, uh, that well, that's not that's not a grace filled message, message, or 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 that's performance, or you know whatever other yeah, negative days. word. But this is this stuff is good. Now I'm not saying it can't be negative because if it's applied wrongly, yeah. it 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 can be negative. But so can anything, <laughs> anything. Food is a good thing. Applied wrongly, it's called gluttony. Right. You know. All right, obedience, a setting, a setting of the heart, a determination. Now, why that's important is what happens is this is where God meets us. If we say, Lord, I am determined. I am going to set my heart to pursue you. I'm going to pursue you with all my heart. I'm going to be wholehearted as much as I know how. And, and, we, and we, uh, we just go to God in prayer with that commitment then that's when His enabling grace comes to help us learn how to do that for us. And there'll be certain common denominators for all of us, and there'll be certain unique things that are unique to you. But God's enabling grace comes when we set our will to be obedient. Um, That's when His grace comes. That's when His power comes, because we're saying can't do it on my own. I don't know how to do this. All I know is I want to be obedient and I want to love you. You you have been so good to me and you've given me your all. Now I'm going to give you my all. Now my all is a whole lot less than your all, but it's all I've got. And he says, that's all I'm asking for. And so uh, that that grace can come um, if we set our will it's, I just believe it's just kind of like God just smiles when we set our will and He says, that's all I'm asking for. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. Comments on that? Essentially, it's like setting a goal. You're just you're aiming at something. Yeah, you may not get it right, but it's sort of like jumping out of an airplane. Yeah, you can jump out of an airplane and your, your parachute could malfunction and you could yeah. and you could be saved. Yeah. However, you don't aim for jumping out yeah. of an airplane without a parachute. Yeah. Well, I can I can promise you you won't get it right. And by that I mean you've got this resetting thing that happens all the time. And God understands that. We we always have to reset. But he is pleased when we start with a commitment to obey him in seeking him with our whole heart and then the reset he get that's what the holy spirit's for the holy spirit help gives us wisdom 
when we're off course and when we need to reset. And it'll happen. I mean, you'll get off course. Perhaps you ought to change the subject of the name of the sermon to obedience training. Huh? Name that is change the name uh, instead of calling it a sermon, call it obedience, obedience training. training. Ah, just in general. Yeah. Ah, I see. I see what you're saying. I'm not even trying to be funny, but that's really what it is. I mean, learning to obey God and, and follow. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I know. I just throw out the weird stuff. I was looking like, okay. Well, at first I did. Well, at first we thought it was just this you were referring to, but you're saying sermons in general are obedience training, especially in the Protestant churches, where it's yeah. more on your interactive relationship with Christ. You're my translator. <laughs> I'm glad to help. <laughs> Sorry, man. All right. The second thing I want you to write down, B, is I want you to write down this interesting phrase, which I will define. I'm just going to say voluntary love. There's a T. Oh, oh thank you. Voluntary. All right. Jeremy keeps me straight here. Voluntary love. So, all right. God says, pursue me with all your heart. And what, what he's after is not a bunch of robots or computers. He's after our hearts. He, his goal in, from the very beginning in Genesis was to create a people that can relate to him and that he can have fellowship with, and that he can share his glory with, and his creation with, and that can walk in beautiful love with him forever. Uh, that the uh, that he wants to uh, equip a suitable bride for his son. You know, the church is called the, the bride of Christ. This fellowship is what it's all about. Now, I mean, he could have created robots or computers, but no, he creates humans with the ability to respond to him or not. Hmm. The choice. Exactly. And that's what this volun what he wants is voluntary love, not coerced mm-hmm. love. He wants voluntary lovers that will love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength because they choose to, because they can choose not to. And that's the beauty of it. What's the one thing that uh, the one? The, let me say it different. The one thing I can give God that He doesn't already have is my love. Is is that's the one thing I can give Him. I mean, he's already got everything, but he doesn't. He's created me, but he does not have my love until I choose to give it to him. That's the one thing he doesn't have, and that's what he desires. Yeah. And he and he so esteems us, the crown of his creation is mankind. He so esteems us that he gives us the choice to pursue him or not. Yeah. How valuable are we? We are him. We're so valuable that he came in Christ to redeem us because we were incapable of redeeming ourselves. And so that's how valuable we are, but we still get a choice. So he wants voluntary voluntary lovers. I just love that phrase. I've kind of been meditating, it on, meditating on it for a while. It, responses to, to that. Well, when, when Tim was talking about why people aren't going path towards Jesus or, yeah. you know, um, I think a lot of, especially children when they're younger, are co- were coerced into having to go to church and yes. having to do this. And so yes. they build up this animosity where it wasn't really voluntary love. That's why it right. takes them so long to get back to Jesus right. later on. It does. I just feel That's like this perfect. animosity, like, why? You know, I didn't want to do this. Yeah. Or oh, they're just inoculated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's it. And, and you look at it, and it's interesting. You, in the other way, you look at when the kids are young, and you love on them, and they like those times that they just return voluntarily to you as a dad or whatever. It's just like, and it kind of blows your mind because it's like 
you want them to, but they, you don't control them. They make a choice. And that, just a small element of what God created human beings with the capacity. Again, the choice. Just like, yeah. That's the thing that would like, because it gives, there's a trust. There's almost like, there are going to be some people who are totally going to spit in my face and some that will choose me. And I'm willing to take the amount of hurt it, hurt, it takes to me for some people to choose me. And as a dad, you know when you're getting a voluntary love versus... They're trying to manipulate you. Or, yeah. Yeah. And you know what you're doing. always. It's really <laughs> yeah. If your kid's good. <laughs> <laughs> you may realize later on, but at the time, you're like... You've been Sometimes the manipulation is worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there are. There are times we try to do that with God. Like, well, I'm trying to gain sister. I know he God wants something. Us feels to feel good. <laughs> Who didn't tell me? <laughs> All right, let's look at C. I'd like, and for C, I'd like you to write dialogue with God, parentheses, prayer. So to put that in context, how do we respond to the great first commandment? One is by obedience, a setting of our heart. We respond in voluntary love. And then C, dialogue with God. Prayer is just dialogue. Prayer is just conversation. Prayer is trust. Um, and... If we are going to love, how in the world can we love with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength the person that we don't talk to? Yeah. You know, that's impossible. Doesn't work well with our spouses. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't work well with that which we can see, let alone that which we can't see. And um, so this, this interaction the way he has given us to interact with him is through prayer. And yes, prayer can be thought, but I, if you just limit it to thought, it's a little, it gets a little vague. And so I would encourage you to uh, make dialogue, that's why I deliberately use the word dialogue, meaning speaking to him, I would encourage you to make that a very real part of your relationship and not just not just think that prayer is some some thought life, you know. And I'm not saying God's not big enough to interact with us through our thoughts. That's how he communicates to us, is through our mind. But I think that we can significantly I think we can encounter him in a uh, a more meaningful way for us through actual dialogue. Are you speaking, verbalizing your thoughts instead of just? Yeah. I'm just talk, talking. Being silent and thinking. Well, yeah. You're, should prayer be should prayer be verbalized? I think. I think it. I is think. That, well, I think. Yes, I think prayer should be should be verbalized. Do I think that's the only way to pray? No. And do I believe in silent meditation? Yes. And do I believe that when I read the scripture? that God can speak to my mind and make something alive to me. Yes. In fact, when I read the Scriptures, I like to dialogue with God. Now, I'm, when I'm reading them, you can either read them out loud or, or just read them silently. And when I get to something that speaks to me, I'll stop and I'll say, Wow, God, what, help me. Give me a little more on that. that just, that's, hard, that's hard for me to grasp. Give me a little more. And then I'll wait silently. And he'll, he'll often give me more. So dialogue with God as you meditate on the Scriptures and as you read the Scriptures. But take prayer walks, just as an example. And I just love to get out. Put, if the weather's bad, I just put on a big coat. And it's just getting alone with God and talking to Him. Uh, driving in your car. I know it seems like all men pray in the shower. So I don't need to encourage that. But, uh, uh, you know, just dialogue with God. Whatever that looks like to you, talk to Him. You cannot have a relationship with that that you do not communicate with. Question, comments? Agree, disagree? All right, D. Um, I've got Revelation... Slash meditation on God's word. Meditation on God's word. 
Uh, when I say revelation, I mean revelation from God's Word that comes through reading it and meditating on it. Um, there is such a tendency in our country to a plenty and where the Bible has been the best-selling book for ever, seemingly, to devalue this because we all probably have five or ten of these sitting around somewhere at our house going back to great-grandma. There's a tendency to devalue it. And my experience is... Um, well, let's see. Let me, let me tell you a story that illustrates my experience and, and why I believe that there is power in this book. I, I went through a period where I was... Oh, let's see. My first motorcycle trip <clears throat> was about um, 20 years ago. And I just got my bike and I was going to ride to San Antonio, Texas, and, um, and back. And I was oh having so much fun. No, didn't have didn't have any family that I had to relate to at that time. I mean, I had kids. At, I had a wife and kids at home. But I mean, for me, it was freedom. I was get to take this trip, so I didn't have to relate to anybody at work. Didn't have to relate to the family, and I could just be alone with my thoughts and the beauty of God's creation and enjoying this incredible machine and all these wonderful little back roads that I took to get there. And I was just having a great time. And uh, so about the third day, I had not read any scripture during that time. I had barely thought about God. <coughs> All I, I was just thrilled to, to this freedom because there, there was a lot of pent-up demand <laughs> within me for this experience. And I've been looking forward to it for a long time. But about the third day, I noticed I began to get cold inside. I began to get dull spiritually. I began to think about, oh, what's the next bike I can get? And how can I get more riding time? And wow, that chick is dynamite. And uh, how can I get more money? And, you know, I just began to get dull and instead of the things of the world growing strangely dim, as the hymn says, the things of the world were growing bigger, and they were being magnified, and my heart was growing dull, and it was pulling away from God. Now, my solution was, I, it scared me. I repented. I said, Lord, I, we've got to right this ship before... I get way off. I mean, you know, remember my line? I was headed this way. <laughs> I was headed straight down. And the Lord said, This is what you, this is what I, I, He says, I think if you'll do what I'm going to tell you, you can right this ship. And He said, Every time you stop, and I stopped about every hour and a half or two for a coca, a, co a cola, a, a water, a bathroom, a gas stop, whatever, a, a, a pretty lake, a creek. He said, every time you stop, read just a little bit of my word. Just pick a psalm or pick a book of the Bible and start going through it. Just read a chapter every time you stop. And I said, that's great. I can do that. And I did that. And inside of four or five stops, after four or five stops, I just began to feel life being breathed back into me. Through the word, through the word, there's a, there's a. I don't understand it. Why God chose to communicate to us this way, but He has put a power and a life in these scriptures that is beyond anything that our rational mind can comprehend. And you know, in a couple of days, I was back in good shape spiritually, full, seeking Him, even more grateful for the lesson that I had learned. So that, and, and, and as a result of stopping and filling myself with the Word, when I was writing, I had, I could draw on that life, I could draw on that deposit that I had put in me. And so my fellowship with the Lord while I was writing was 
greatly enhanced, and every just everything changed. Anybody want to comment on that or relate your own experience? Jeremy? When I was in college, I had a, a French professor who talked about tithing, and she talked about there's financial tithing, which is, of course, scriptural, and then but she also talked about time tithing. And she's, I remember even now, she's like, you know, you're going to come up on one of my tests, and you're going to be like a crazy person, be like, I can't remember any of this stuff. And she's like, I would encourage you to stop and read some extra in your Bible, and then study for like an hour, and then stop and read a little extra in your Bible. Using that tithe of that time and just remembering that it's God who's going to bring it to your attention or not. And I started doing that in college. And even now, I'll have times where I'll be web developer or things like that. And I'm so in the weeds. Like, there's no way I'm going to make deadline. And I'll do it. Like, I'll set alarms, like, every hour or whatever. And I'll stop and I'll read a chapter. Mm. And then it's like hit my mind expands in a way that is absolutely like I've had stuff where I've gotten like 10 days worth of stuff done in two days mm -hmm. because he was but I was remembering that when this trouble I had to be on my knees that he was the one who would get me through it not that Jeremy's brilliance which doesn't exist but uh, that, it would, that it would get me through yeah that's good I think one of the amazing developments in, in smartphones has been the Bible app mm -hmm. but it's funny because on my break at work you know, Xerox, huge company, tons of people, you know, and this is all people are doing on their break. Yeah. yeah. And then I find myself checking my Facebook page and checking my emails and yeah. I don't, I don't take the time even, you know, one minute to read a passage in the Bible and I've got the app on my phone. I mean, it should just be used on Sunday or in special, you know, meetings like that, like this. And I, I, I would admit that I don't, you know. Yeah. So that's kind of inspired me when I'm feeling dull. Yeah, disconnected. You know, to, to get that There's connection. That. It, it, isn't it great that he gave us this resource that when we feel disconnected, we can feel connected? Yeah, and you do. I have read any time I read the Bible. I'm yeah. Energized. All right, two more and then we'll stop for tonight. Uh, e, write the word fellowship. <laughs> and... What was that? <laughs> <laughs> it's stupid jokes about fellowshipping, and uh, it, it has no basis. That's why I shut up. But thanks for bringing it out there. Uh, my fellowship, I'm talking about with other believers, and uh, we love God when we embrace His body. That's what we're doing here tonight. That's what you're doing when you have somebody over to your house for dinner. Uh, that's what you're doing when you go out and share life with a brother. The, and God can come to us in fellowship. God comes to us in fellowship in a way that he does not come when we're C, dialoguing with God in prayer one-on-one. -on -one. We need both. We need a corporate... Ex uh, God comes in a corporate expression in a way that he will not come to us individually. And he comes, and he comes individually, in a way that he doesn't come corporately. We've got to have both to have to be properly to love him well, and to be totally full. I, I in my analogy, I am convinced that we need both. Um, if if it's all about fellowship, and you find some people that are highly relational, and they. They find it easy to fellowship, but they find it hard to get along with God and have this dialogue. And many times they become shallow people. They don't have roots that go down because they haven't engaged God in the Scriptures. They haven't engaged God in prayer. They have a shallow root system. And then, but... There, there are people that are more introverted by nature that find it easy to do see the dialogue with God, the prayer part, the one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. and find it very awkward down here in terms of fellowship. Mm -hmm. And they're missing out, too. Because They're missing get, out. You can get off track. If you're just dialoguing with God, 
and you're not coming to physically with other people, mm-hmm. you can get off track. There are times that you can get confused. Like maybe there was a certain thing God was telling you and you had a few things of your own that kind of muddled the, muddied the waters. Mm-hmm. And you're going off, whereas if you're meeting a kid with other believers, they can kind of go, well, that doesn't yeah. really sound biblical. Right. It sounds a little like you went off here. Right. Otherwise, it's me and my interpretation of God could get off. And if I don't have others to help me, kind of remind me. That's a, I, I didn't even... It was implied, but I forgot to mention it, the safety aspect of walking with brothers to keep me from getting too far off. In check. In check. There really is the accountability part of it, the safety part of it, as well as just the life of God that we experience in the body that we do not experience alone. So we, we, need, we need both. Anybody else on fellowship? Yes, there's, there's an illustration called the wheel, um, which is represented by a wheel. Jesus is yeah, the hub. the navigators. Yeah, well, it happens to be that's where I learned it. Yeah. Um, and the verti- there's four spokes in it. The two vertical spokes are our relationship with God, right. which are Bible and prayer. Mm-hmm. And the, ver- the horizontal spokes are fellowship. Mm-hmm. There with are with people, mm-hmm. and that's fellowship and evangelism mm-hmm. or outreach. Right. And if the the point of the illustration is if you don't have your spokes in balance, then your wheel isn't really a wheel running smooth. That's true. That's, but true. that's so. You're that's C a great and D, illustration. Your C and D are your vertical spokes, and then right. E. I don't know what your F is going to be, but if it's got anything to do with outreach. Uh, no. You can change it. I can change it. <laughs> you can change it. Yeah. I'm it's guessing that's right. in the second commandment. Yeah. Well, as as we've been going through this, I've I've been I turned immediately to Hebrews. I'm not going to read all this in Hebrews to you, but it, it just it's remarkable how we've been following what Hebrews third fourth chapter talks about, and this in particular Hebrews uh, three twelve thirteen. It says, take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. Mm-hmm. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Mm-hmm. And it's just so important to have other people encourage you. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is. Being isolated alone is, is a very difficult thing, even for the strongest Christian. It's dangerous. Yeah, it is. It's Hebrews three twelve and thirteen. The, and the, you know, Satan loves the Lone Ranger in the sense that the, the believer that thinks they can are strong enough to go it alone is more easily picked off by the wolves, mm-hmm. whereas together there's a strength and a safety in numbers. I, I, I fear the Lord in a healthy way to, um, um, you know, like if I if I were to get frustrated with my church or my fellowship and I thought, oh, I'm just going to go it alone, that, that would be the poorest decision I, I, I could make. Stay home and watch TV. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, well, I, I that's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to not have the benefit of the body of Christ. Living relationships that they can feed me, they can correct me, I can feed them, they can, they can, and I can correct them. You know, there's this life exchange. It's just the way God works. Mm-hmm. It's the way He's designed it. Okay. All right, last one is worship. Uh, the the point about evangelism, uh, I. Because we're talking about the first commandment, loving God, you know, I've, I've deliberately left evangelism out, but that's part of the second commandment, loving others. And so that's why it doesn't, it doesn't quite fit in this teaching, but that wheel is still a great illustration. All right, worship. Uh, <laughs> there's something that happens in corporate worship that doesn't happen in individual worship. It, and I, again, I don't understand it. But when I worship with word, with songs and worship songs and music, 
uh, you know, I don't, I don't understand music. I am not a musician. All I know is something inside of me yep. responds to music because it's God created, and I believe it's something that we will enjoy forever. I think it's a part of it will be a huge part of eternity is music, and the combination of the of the music of the of the words of a of a well crafted worship song. And the corporateness of doing it together, there is a way that the life of God comes into you individually and into you corporately when you worship. And so to experience the fullness of the first commandment of loving Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, corporate worship has to be a part of that. Any... any uh, Thoughts on that or experiences? I mean, I hadn't, I had not sung with the praise band in a month, maybe five weeks. Um, it was sad that you, that I missed you this morning, but it was just, well, my heart felt so full as a musician, as a singer, being able to share and praise God and sing out with, with my heart. Mm. To God yeah. this morning, and it was just like, oh, yeah. and, and it, it breathed it, life and, into you, and it made it a complete worship service. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah. It was just yeah. People for us too, though, Scott. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. But, and one thing I had to do, I, yeah, I you can't take, keep your gifts in your pocket, you know? Right, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And especially when you're doing it for God, it's like, right. it's mm-hmm. not for me. It's not for me. It's for you know. Yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. amazing. Lynn can explain it better than I can, but um, music makes your brain work and uses a part of your brain differently than other yeah. things do, and your memory and, and stuff like that. Yeah. I can't explain it all, but uh, it's, there's something that music does yeah. physiologically in the brain that's, that's different than when we talk or when we write or think mm-hmm. and other things. Mm-hmm. I love it when Paul s- says in many places, um, on the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I just love that phrase. Mm-hmm. <laughs> on the, on the Lord's day, the I Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. Then he goes on to talk about something. I'm always going. I think I know what that is, you know, because I can't say that every Lord's day I'm in the Spirit, but but when when that does happen, it it, it fills me up for a long time. <laughs> yeah. You know, my heart's full for many days. Mm-hmm. And and I can't honestly say that every Lord's Day I'm in the Spirit. And it's not because God doesn't want me to be. It's because I've filled myself up with other junk before mm-hmm. I get to worship. But it's infectious, too. It is. I mean, you it's look contagious. out there and it's, you it's, see other people that are, and, and you just, it, you get caught up in the mm-hmm. moment. And it's, you know, and then it's almost like a collective yeah. in the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know? I've had weeks where, like, I've been I've been in the Word, I've been with God throughout the week, and it's you know it's been a decent week throughout. And then I'll go, and during worship we're singing, and I'm just weeping, like I'm just like God just hits me, oh, and you're just like on stage. boom, you know, and you're you're just like, and why? But again, it's that element that clearly there's a reason Jesus brought those two commandments as pretty much the two top. God first, but then a relationship with others that we're needed for our relationship with Him. I think that's why church camp is so important too, especially for, for children. Uh, that's what it, you know focuses. But um, I know for myself, uh, some of the most, some of the moments where I felt closest to God have been at church camp, where collectively the youth were in the spirit, and I mean it was that all-encompassing kumbaya moment. <laughs> you know, that was just yeah. awe-inspiring. Yeah. Just, well, we were created to worship. Yeah. So it's a yeah. fulfillment of our, you know, purpose uh, was to worship. Yeah. We Both will, song and dance. We will forever. If we think we understand worship now, just think, I mean, let's say on a 1 to 100 scale, we're, we're at a 1% level of yeah. comprehending worship and experiencing true worship. Mm-hmm. I believe we're at a 1% level compared to what we will be in eternity. Yeah. I believe it's that important. And I don't and I believe it'll be that satisfying. I mean, you think about the the uh, angels around his throne that day and night 
24-7, of course, we, there won't be time, say holy, 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 and sing holy, 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 holy. I don't think that's because they are computers programmed to say that. I think that's because that is springing up in them. That's a genuine, that's all they can, that's all they know to do. They're feeling it that strongly that they express it that way. Okay? And I believe that we'll be able to touch that in heaven, and I believe we touch that now. And I believe God wants to give wants us to uh, give ourselves to it as as the first commandment. And um, and I believe that we're that something has changed in us. And I believe that the capacity is increased in us when we do encounter God in worship. It's one of those mysteries. It's just like the scripture. It's just one of those mysteries. How does it happen? I don't know, but all I know is it happens. It's very real. For me, being part of the worship, yeah. part part of the, the band and stuff that actually plays, <clears throat> it's been the single most growing event <clears throat> in my entire life yeah. that I've grown uh, spiritually closer closer to God. Yeah. And you know, at first it was a distraction, to be honest with you, because it was. I was so nervous about the way that we were going to sound, and whether we were going to play, if I was going to mess up. Right, right. And yeah, so I, I couldn't, I was so worked up. Mm-hmm. You know, even during when, when Don was speaking and during sermon time, knowing that we had to play the next song, I was trying to remember the chords, are we going to, how's this going to work? And, yeah. You know, but it's <laughs> after doing it for so long, and it's not so long, but after a while, that, that this fades. And, yeah. yeah. It feels like, you know, now you really because can enter in. I, yes, I can enter into worship. Mm-hmm. Where before I was always just a consumer. Right. right. And and uh, then I was, I, what I felt was was part of an orchestrator. Right. Or at least giving giving my talents to God and having God speak to those talents. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, but then it kind of took a little bit of focus off of some of my ability to consume. Right. But the more comfortable you become in doing that, the more yeah. it's, you, you, you're consuming the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was hard hard for me coming from a performance based background where approval is applause and it's not about God, it's about you. Mm-hmm. You know, because I've done theater, music, you know, radio, all that. To take myself out of the performance and give it to God, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's taken a long time. And this morning, it was, it was just such a great feeling giving everything to God, not caring mm-hmm. about me. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean, like, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, I'm like him. It's just it's been a great journey with, with these guys. Yeah, it really has been. I walk out of, of be back. worship service on Sunday many times, thinking, "How can I, how can I maintain this? Yeah. This feeling I have in my heart, this fullness that I have in my heart mm-hmm. all week, yeah. and and yeah, I have failed miserably at maintaining that." Yeah. And I'd say that F is what I do best, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the uh, other stuff needs work, you know. Right. <laughs> so, that's uh, why we're here. To talk yeah, about absolutely. It. <laughs> well, that's absolutely. why I think Sunday night is this is great because mm-hmm. it just bolsters you and, and yeah. prepares you for you know. And I really do like that. It. Yeah. And I like it when it's like, it's great when it's like everybody, but I like it when it's like guys, because, you know, we're just, there's specific ways we see things that, you know, when you're talking to other guys. Yeah. Well, you don't have, uh, don't you have nice ear rings? This is very true. I, <laughs> I've, I've, I've asked that many times of Don, and then he's like, I don't have an ear ring. Oh, I do. And I'm not getting one. <sighs> <laughs> Nina said you were. Right? I had a dream. I put all my piercings back in. By the way, it's the weirdest thing. When I came here, I was just dude, so I think funny. I, so I funny. Think it's you so had funny a dream that... I had today, and it was really weird. So sorry, sorry I didn't mean to get us off. Sorry, sorry. things change. <laughs> piercings. Why don't this? Well, I'll we'll save Roman numeral three and four. And if you invite me back, we'll talk some more about this and, and other things. But I want to be respectful of your time, and this might be a good place to stop.
You say the trailer. Yeah, I said those two are the trailer for the next. <laughs> there are two. Each one of these is taking a loose sequel. Yeah, yeah. 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 three and four. Oh, we got a one and two combo. <laughs> Do you get the idea that Biff kind of likes doing this? <laughs> we kind of like Biff. Yeah, yeah, I don't like Biff. Not in shows. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. Well, I can't. Yeah. They're also the new Biff. Are you a Sunday school teacher? Yeah. Yeah. It shows too. You do a good job. They're excited about the new bike club you're starting here as well. Yeah, we're, we're with our scooters. <laughs> scooter, scooter, scooter club. I'll have cuts. He he chimed in and said that my wife always wanted to be an old lady. <laughs> 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 in the biker no, club. Are there which no, no, I was going to say. That's oh, not, oh, not a lot of wisdom. Is that what you're going to say? You threw that one out of the way. Oh, shoot. I forgot <laughs> that. Night is a biker old lady. Uh, well, the bikes would be clean. I've got, a name, I've got a name for your biker club. Excellent. Let's hear it. Instead of the wild hogs, you all remember the movie, The Wild oh, Hogs? Yes. It would be the mild hogs. The mild hogs. That sounds very underground and eventful. We need something more exciting. Just because we're just because we're Christian doesn't mean that we're like boring now. Right. Come on, the little pink porky logo on the back, the mild hogs. I'm sorry, no. That was hilarious the way that. And that no, the sheep and the goats. Well, there we go. <laughs> Great. Bye. The goat. No, the it's the goat. sheep. The, 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 the wolf hunters. There we go. The goat. The goat. The goats ride the left hand side road. Thank you again, Bill. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.